point, just like I was asked 15 years ago, what are the limits of air cooling? These days I'm being asked, what are the limits of single phase mm -hmm. water cooling? Hi, I'm Levin, CEO of Diabetics and host of the Cooling Channel podcast. In this podcast, I interview experts and leaders in the field of thermal engineering. In today's episode, I will be talking to Alfonso Ortega, a professor at the University of Villanova, USA. Uh, professor Ortega has been studying uh, different forms of heat transfer at fundamental level uh, over the past 35 years, um, starting with natural convection in the beginning of his career, uh, and that evolved into forced convection with boiling. Um, I really enjoyed this talk, so I hope you enjoyed this episode. Hi, El, uh, welcome on the show. Hi, Levin. Uh, nice to be part of this uh, podcast. I think you have a wonderful idea here. I'm glad to be part of it. Okay, great, great. Uh, yeah, El, we, we met, uh, I think, last year uh, at Simiterm for the very first time. Um, so, and, and ever since then, we were, we were uh, I think, uh, indirectly in touch, uh, also via, via our, our, uh, our networks, via LinkedIn, etc. But um, maybe for the people that don't know you yet, uh, can, you, can we just start with uh, a short introduction of uh, two, three minutes uh, from your end? Who are you and, and what is your, in this case, your, your research about? Yeah. Yeah, glad to, um, glad to do that, Livin. I am one of the old timers now. I don't know how this happens, but at some point in your career, you find you're the oldest guy in the room. <laughs> uh, never thought it would happen to me. Um, I've been, I've been in the electronics cooling research area all of my career since the late eighties. Um, I got my, I got my training, uh, my PhD at, in Stanford in the late 80s, and I worked on a dissertation problem related to natural convection cooling of telecommunication systems. It, that was a hot topic at the time, to use a pun. Um, and uh, I did experimental research related to that. So after I received my doctorate, I um, continue to work in electronics cooling and have continued my entire career now, 35 years. Um, I went to the University of Arizona in my first academic position. And at, at Arizona, I established a laboratory called the Laboratory for Advanced Thermal and Fluid Systems. Um, and so a lot of the research that we've done uh, that I did in that first half of my career was in air cooling. A lot of the work was motivated by needs in electronics. Um, that could be handled by air. And because of my training, you know, I was, you know, uh, well trained to do experimental and computational research in things like heat sinks and air cooled enclosures and, and so forth. Um, but you know, in my, in my research and in, as an academic professor, you know, we obviously always need to do contemporary impactful research. So the research trends continue to increase power, increase power density, increase heat flux. And at some point, you know, everybody really was very interested in what's what's after air cooling, what what's next. And of course, liquid cooling is the next step. So I found myself shifting a lot more of my research to the area of liquid cooling, um, especially when I moved from the West Coast, from Arizona to the East Coast, Villanova University, where I've been the last 15 years. Um, a lot of the research I'm working on now is in the area of liquid cooling. So. That's not to say that air cooling is not important, but at some point, you know, you reach limits, especially on the high power end, on the high power processors, whether they're CPU. At some point, you reach limits that are related to how large a heat sink can you use? Uh, how much airflow can you tolerate because of the acoustic noise? You know, how many RU units, you know, how many RUs can you take up in a, in a rack for an air cooled system? So it's at some point, really, and I think we're there now, at some point you have to give up on air cooling. You have to switch over to more efficient cooling on the on the high power end. We'll always need air cooling. For example, on servers, we always have low power components. They will continue to be cooled with air in data centers as, they, as they're configured now. But, but we're increasingly going to need better ways to transfer heat out of the high power processors. So... That's what I've been doing for the last 10 years since um, by my move to the East Coast. I brought my laboratory with me. 
uh, almost everything we're working on these days is related to electronic cooling is related either to single phase or two phase, uh, you know, force convection cooling. I teach courses in thermodynamics, heat transfer, uh, fluid mechanics, but I'm also really proud to teach courses on thermal fluid design. In fact, I teach a class on thermal management of electronic systems, which is there are not many courses like that at the university level that are that are taught, and I'm very glad to teach that class. It helps students to integrate their knowledge into a real application, and that's what I like about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I've seen um, I've, I've I've seen that that part of your your research also focuses on direct to chip liquid cooling. Uh, so I, I I guess that's that's where you see then the the next step or, or uh, of of cooling yeah. or, or how do it yeah. I do, I do live, and I guess uh, I don't want to be overly controversial here or anything. <laughs> I think I'm a science, I'm a scientist, and I don't have any vested interest in technology. But I, I would say right now in the in the big discussion about what's next for cooling technologies, especially for data centers, for example, which is where I'm focusing a lot of my work, uh, and and increasingly in automotive. Um, I think in the area of data centers, for example, there's there's a, a lot of people that are interested in what's next. And I think two technologies seem to dominate the conversation. One of them is immersion cooling. Mm -hmm. um, and another one is direct to chip um, mm -hmm. liquid cooling. OK, um, I happen to be pretty well equipped in my lab to contribute to knowledge in the direct to chip cooling. But of course, I'm very, very interested in in all cooling technologies. But we're working primarily on direct to chip. A lot of the research that we're working on is to improve coal plates, to in, in to reduce the thermal resistance or thermal impedance, you know, chip to coolant. I think that's one of the primary, really important uh, things that that thermal engineers like myself are working on these days. Um, but what we're also working on the next thing as researchers, we're interested in knowing. Well, at some point, just like I was asked. 15 years ago, what are the limits of air cooling? These days, I'm being asked, what are the limits of single phase mm -hmm. water cooling? You know, warm, warm water cooling. People want to know already, how far am I going to be able to push this technology? How far am I going to be able to take this, right? Um, I re we recently wrote a paper. We wrote a paper and published it last week. It was the first time we published anything on our sort of thinking about limits, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so we do we do see and we can identify natural physical limits beyond which it, it won't make sense to continue to push push more liquid through a coal plate, right? You will bump up against natural limits, whether it's pressure drop or there's one that a lot of people don't think about, but they're called erosion limits, mm -hmm. right? At some point, yeah. uh, metal structure that you start to erode the metal. Right. And that really is a physical limit. You just can't push flow any harder than that. Right. Um, so because of these limits, we're already thinking about other ways. Right. Especially two phase uh, convective boiling. Right. Where you where you change phase from liquid to vapor. That's a tougher problem, as you know. I've, I know that you've worked in this area in diabetics. I know that um, that you did a really nice study kind of thinking about, you know, as engineering designers, what do we need to think about? That's kind of why we're working on that. That's what yeah. we're working on these days. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Huh? So we had a few years ago a request on the on the same topic. Um, or, uh, it was also yeah. from from a research, real research angle. Uh, yeah, it's same question. Mm -hmm. huh? Okay, we know we're we're at the limits of this uh, with with pure liquid cooling. How far can we push it with uh, with boiling? And and yeah, then you struggle. Uh, or we also well, we also stumbled upon the limitations of. of yeah, people not being used to thinking in in terms of of uh, evapor evaporation yet in, in terms of boiling liquids and and yeah and the, the single phase is, is something that then engineers handle quite quite well uh, I would say but uh, as soon as it becomes yeah. boiling it's uh, half of it's considered black magic and the other half uh, highly unstable and and people try to try to stay away yeah. from it uh, at this moment so it's very nice to see that you that you're making progress there. Um, yeah, I, th I think uh, at this moment, um, you are absolutely right. There, there would be resistance. And I'm not suggesting that convective boiling, say boiling coal plates, what you would call evaporators, are really necessary right now, except at the very, mm -hmm. very high end. Okay. But we do need to think about what would be uh, feasible technologies 
you know, for the next step. Obviously, if you're doing uh, road mapping, you need to kind of road map out, you know, what your next level solutions are going to be. Um, I, I would say this about what I have encountered. I think that in engineering design, thermal engineering design, because of the emergence of computational tools like CFD tools, finite element tools, and, and then sort of these integrated, shall we call them flow network modeling tools, right? I think um, engineers in general are comfortable uh, using tools that, that work with the momentum, energy, and mass flow equations in single phase, right? Especially in, in things like coplates and small scale channels, the flows are always laminar. So we have 100% confidence that we can model laminar flow through small channels. And this is why nobody is afraid to model coplates or, or heat sinks as long as the flow is laminar, mm -hmm. right? I think we all know that it becomes more difficult if we have to consider that the flow might be turbulent, right? But that rarely happens in water cooling through small small diameter channels, right? So we're very happy. We can get experimental data. We get good agreement with our, with our models. Uh, there are some commercial tools available for doing f uh, flow network modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, that's what eventually makes engineers comfortable is the availability of tools, mm -hmm. right? Availability of design tools, okay? Now, what, what's happened, of course, what, where we are now in two-phase pumped cooling is there there is no CFD for boiling heat transfer. There are no commercial tools that can do the equivalent of CFD for, uh, you know, for uh, nucleate boiling, whether it's pool boiling or whether it's, it's convective boiling, no such thing. So in that sense, then, there's a lot less comfort. In fact, there's no comfort level mm -hmm. in, in the engineering community because it's still too spooky, right? Yep. Um, there is no confidence that I can do this correctly, right? Uh, and I think that's kind of the frontier where research labs like mine and others should be working, right? We should be working on trying to increase our knowledge, trying to get better tools and models, um, so that, you know, design engineers can have confidence and be able to design things, right? So I think that's kind of where things are right now. And, and that really is the frontier that I'm working at right now yeah. in our lab. But, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. Eh? I think I, especially simulation with uh, of, of boiling liquids, it's uh, also for us, I, we had basically had to develop our mo the modeling ourselves and, 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 and code it uh, yeah. almost from, from scratch because there was very, very, very little uh, available. But does it then mean that also with your research, um, well, in, in the project we did, the research project um, that we did with our partners, yeah, experiments had a very, very dominant role in it because uh, basically the, the every design that was made was immediately measured and experimentally and then verified uh, if the simulations matched the, the experiments. Is it then the same with, with your research that the experiments have a, has a very dominant role or is it uh, more as, as a final check uh, afterwards? On, on That's a really great question and I'm, I'm glad to discuss it with you. I'm, it's experiments, right? I mm -hmm. mean, the answer, the simple answer is experiments, <coughs> good experiments are, are really critical, right? Uh, there are kind of like two different kinds of experiments. Um, the, two-phase flow and heat transfer research experts, right, um, like to work on v geometries that are very fundamental, like uh, a circular diameter pipe or tube, mm -hmm. right, um, or, or things like that, right. Um, I think that the, that the knowledge gained leads to correlations, leads to understanding of how to predict pressure drop and heat transfer coefficient, right. Um, and then those get translated into simulation tools. But for example, we are working, doing a lot of research on uh, evaporators, right? The mm -hmm. coplates for two-phase flow. Let's call those evaporators instead of calling those coplates. Yeah. Okay, so, so in evaporators, um, it's the same problems, right? We have to optimize the geometry. We have to optimize the fin structure. We have to optimize the the flow rate ranges that are useful. We have to also take precautions for instabilities because uh, two-phase flows, unlike single-phase flows, have some unique instabilities which are related to 
the uh, the dynamic evolution of you know vapor, the interaction between liquid and vapor within channels and so forth and so on. And so we also need to take into that into account, right? So you need to do really careful experiments in mm-hmm. addition to fundamental experiments on channels, say single things. You also need to do experiments on prototype real things like prototype evaporators, right? And I think that's one of the things that um, that is required now. And so when I talk about modeling, since we don't have any CFD for two phase, then by the very nature of the field, you have to build what I would call uh, physics-based ad hoc models, right? Physics-based yeah. models that, that take uh, correlations for friction factor or heat transfer coefficient in order to be able to predict the temperature, the shall, the shall we call it the RQ curve, the resistance flow rate curve for that evaporator, right? And then the other thing that is really, really important is you can't use water in uh, in a boiling evaporator, right? Temperature, boiling temperatures are too high. So we're talking here about using funny fluids, refrigerants mm-hmm. primarily, yeah. right? And then the other part of the equation is tuning or choosing your refrigerant so that the saturation temperature, the boiling temperature, is at about the temperature that you want to absorb heat, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that that refrigerant choice is also a very critical part of this overall designing uh, an effective two-phase pump, two-phase evaporator in a cooling system. I haven't even touched on the overall system then. Beyond that then, that's just the evaporator. Beyond that, you have to be able to manifold it. You have to be able to reject the heat. You have to be able to flow this partly liquid, partly vapor mixture back to where you're going to reject heat. So it's much more complicated. Mm-hmm. I guess maybe this is kind of a long answer to to say no <laughs> wonder, no wonder there's reluctance <laughs> to jump into it, yeah. right? <laughs> there's just too many issues. There's a lot of yeah. issues to be overcome. Yeah. Yeah, but it's yeah. good. Huh? Many, many years of funded research ahead. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yes, you know, you know, the world that I live in is is yes. We need to get funded to work in these areas, and we are. We're getting a lot of funding mm-hmm. to to pursue these areas. And you know, the thing that that's pretty pretty neat in these in this kind of work I live in is is partnering with industrial partners mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a we have a research center in at Villanova and two other universities Binghamton University and UT Arlington uh, in which industry partners partner with us uh, and a consortium kind of an mm-hmm. arrangement um, and so we're not working on research that is shall we say blue sky um, a lot of the work that we're doing is motivated by questions that our partners are asking yeah, us yeah. to to address, right? And so I think that's kind of the way we can make more rapid progress is just by this very close interaction with industry partners. Uh, and I'm really, really enjoying that. I have enjoyed that style of research so much over the last 10 years. Our center is now 10 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, we're we're going to continue for, you know, the foreseeable future this way. Yeah. So when, and um, when, I, when I hear you say, uh, talk about all those those uh, experiments, collecting data, uh, trying to find new correlation, new models, um, do you also see then a role? I, I, I know some people who would immediately argue ah, that that's a perfect case for machine learning or for, for artificial intelligence in general. Do you, yep. do, do you feel that, that pressure also from the industry, from the consortia, that they ask questions in that direction? Or is it also an avenue that you're that you're considering or, or do you do you try to stay away from it? Um. Uh, well, I'm no expert in machine learning or artificial intelligence, but anybody who's not paying attention and trying to learn about these methods is going to miss the boat, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So just to be sure everybody understands where, where I stand, you know that expression, you, you kind of stand where you sit, right? In, in some sense, I'm a traditionalist in the sense that I'm a laboratory scientist, uh, primarily. Um, I work in the laboratory and we, we do very careful experiments to understand what's going on, right? We have to understand phenomena. Um, but obviously we also do modeling and simulation so we can extend our knowledge from the laboratory experiments, you know, we can scale it, we can extend it, etc. Mm-hmm. right? 
there's a lot of people, including people that I work with, that are very much uh, in favor or seeing that uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, can can be used um, to, you know, in some sense, what you the, the philosophy is you use experiments to train a um, an AI algorithm, and if you supply sufficient experimental data over a sufficiently wide parameter set, right, you you can then get a well trained, mm -hmm. um, say, artificial neural <laughs> network that will be able to be predictive, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a lot of work going on in the fundamental in the fundamental community that, that is the community that's looking at very fundamental problems in boiling or in two phase flow in boiling. There's a lot of very advanced work going on there. What I'm talking about here is is maybe a question that I ask my own students. Um, obviously, when you're designing real things, there's a, you know optimization requirement, right? You're trying to mm -hmm. do the best yeah. design, say geometrically, right? Um, so that you ask yourself, well, okay, how do I do the optimization? There's, as you know, there's a hundred different ways you can do optimization. There's as many. There's as many approaches as there are, you know, fins on a coplay, right? <laughs> um, but some of the emerging approaches, as you know, some of the emerging approaches are, are, and some of the more buzzy, shall we say, the more popular approaches these days, are proposing to use artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning um, as a way to do predictions of the behavior that will feed into the, optim the optimization algorithm, whether it's response surface optimization or whatever the, the 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 trendy optimization scheme is these days okay i mean the way i view it as a as a laboratory experimentalist the way i view it is if you have sufficient experimental data that you trust and if it covers a wide enough broad enough uh uh sort of set of parameters uh, i have no doubt that you can use um say an a and n um, and you can train that at that ANN to be able to predict the behavior, right? But the way I view it is, in a sense, what we're doing is super interpolation, right? We're we're mm -hmm. we're we're creating a super interpolator. Yeah, yeah. We're we're, we're uh, basically a very sophisticated curve fitting scheme, multi dimensional curve fitting scheme. I have no problem viewing it that way at all because we've always done research that way. We take experimental data, um, we we um, try to come up with correlations. Here, here's where I do have an opinion that, that I'm trying to form in the way of a, of a research question, is I think that there's room for a hybrid approach where, so this is my objection. My objection in correlating data, whether it's with ANNs or with exponential curve fits, right? My objection to it is that if you don't use a physics-based approach, then you you don't learn as mm -hmm. much as you could have yeah. about yeah. the behavior of your system, right? So I'm much more in favor of even simple physics being embedded in the model, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to pure, pure fitting of experimental outcomes, mm -hmm. right? And that's the, the area that I've been, so in the area of, of AI and using those techniques, that's kind of one interest that I have is how do we how do we do hybrid physical uh, ANN AI kind of driven models? I have a colleague at another university who's an expert on the ANN side, and I and I told him why don't we why don't we find simple examples where we can do physical models, and then let's see if we can use a combination of experimental data, the physical model to train the you know the the um, the AI algorithm. See if, see what we get. Is it more efficient? Is it more accurate? Mm -hmm. um, what I think again. What I think is missing when you don't have physics is you 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 can't learn why. You can only learn what. Mm -hmm. This is what happened, but you don't know why it happened. This is what I think gets lost. Yeah. So and and um, well, with with uh, your your. You're you're in a very I think privileged position in the sense of you can you can train new engineers and you can uh, teach them uh, the right way of thinking or or the a new way of thinking about our problems. Do you also see there an evolution over the uh, over over the past years? Because like, you uh, same with your research, you started them with natural convection, then 
I went through the forced air convection yeah. and uh, forced uh, forced liquid cooling. Now you're in, in the boiling, uh, in the field yeah. of, of boiling. I, I I guess that that it, it must have an impact on on how you how you do the teaching as well and and the message you pass to your students. Or, or am I wrong there? No, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there's been an evolution in what I teach, how I teach, why why I teach, right, these subjects. Um, so let's let's be clear. Uh, some of the research that we work on, a lot of the research we work on is quite fundamental, or it's, mm -hmm. it's more fundamental than thermal design of a, of a thermal management system. It, it's asking more fundamental questions or seeking to learn how do we model more fundamental systems. I have, I'll give you an example. We've been working on the, the impact of a single droplet onto a heated surface for a long time. It's just this pure, beautiful, <laughs> fundamental problem. And why are we working on it? Uh, well, first of all, it's kind of like a hobby by now. I've been working on it for a long time. <laughs> but but secondly, it, it helps us to determine how to use tools, for in this case, how to use tools that can do free surface problems. Um, in addition, it helps us to learn about some real fundamental physics of um, of surface tension um, driven kinds of problems which are important in boiling and in, and in two-phase systems. So the way the way I think our teaching of students has evolved is I, I ask my students to take fundamental courses in convection of course and in in you know the fundamental sciences but increasingly I ask my students in fact I did it this morning I told three of my students it's very important that you take this class on optimization and optimization theory right mm -hmm. i said it you may or, or may not use this knowledge for your phd dissertation but it's really important that in your own training that you understand um, optimization as a tool uh, especially if you're going to work uh, as a in, as an engineer in industry where you're going to be designing you know managing or whatever uh, real things and so I think it's really important that they get training outside of their immediate discipline, right? Um, there are other things that I've that I've evolved as as a teacher. Another area that I believe is very important is is I would I guess I would call it holistic thinking, and the area that I think is very holistic is sustainability. The whole topic mm -hmm. of of sustainability and the role of thermal engineering or engineering in general in sort of a circular economy and the whole idea of sustainable systems. So these things basically are different. It requires a different skill set. It requires that students be generalists and not only sort of real deep, deep uh, experts in one area. So I guess if there's anything that I feel like I've changed over the course of my career, I used to completely adhere to the idea that PhD students should have this incredible depth in one teeny weeny skinny area, right? You are an expert in single phase convective heat transfer, right? Which is the way I graduated, right? That's what I could claim to be when I graduated, mm -hmm. yeah. that this, this narrow hole, right? Um, but I think uh, over my career, I, of course, broadened my knowledge because I learned to think so it would be, you know, obvious to anyone that one of the things we're always trying to do, we will always try to do is, is get students to be critical thinkers, right? Uh, very critical thinkers. And uh, the second thing, though, that I think has evolved in engineering education, at least from, from my standpoint, is increasing the breadth. Increasing the breadth. Uh, uh, an example is mechanical engineers in general in their training, they're terrible chemical engineers. They're chemical. They're terrible at anything related to chemistry, and in many cases, they're terrible at anything related to electronics and electrical engineering. Right? And that's mm -hmm. because they've been trained along these uh, sort of silos. Right? I'm a yeah. mechanical engineer. This is what I know, and I only know what I know. Right? To use that old expression. Right? But that's not good enough anymore. I really don't think that's good enough. I think some of the most successful people working in engineering these days, uh, and I would count some of my own graduates that people have worked with me, are the people that also have breadth, right? Mm -hmm. I can think of a former student of mine who was an undergraduate in chemical engineering, and then he switched over to mechanical engineering. Yeah. And I would say that person has a far greater grasp 
of sort of the general principles of engineering than than somebody that's trained only in one discipline, right? Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the, what I've seen as being uh, emerging has has emerged in pedagogy, shall we say, the you know teaching uh, philosophies. Um, I myself, you know, hopefully I I practice what I preach. I decided. 10 years ago that I have to contribute to to climate change and avoiding climate change. I have to contribute to promulgating and promoting sustainable engineering, right? Yeah. So that, that's that been my growth area over the last 10 years. I've actually learned a lot about sustainability and sustainable engineering as a discipline, right, mm-hmm. uh, in itself. And, and, and I'm now actually uh, supervising students working on those kinds of topics. Yeah. So and uh, and and yeah, you you oh yeah, but you have been working in, in thermal engineering, you know, your your whole career. And okay, there are some some evolution, but are there uh, on the topics that you that you study and and how you look at things? But is there over in, over the course of the years something that you that that has surprised you? I mean, if I just ask you, uh, what what has surprised you over the past years in the field of thermal engineering? Uh, it can be positive or negative. It can be. Uh, a complete standstill, or that there was progress yeah. in, in many different exciting areas. What what would you pick? Well, so here, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, by the way, I love I love this chat with you. I think um, <laughs> it just makes me kind of think about our our field in general, and hopefully, maybe it might help other people. Maybe just give them one idea. That's all mm-hmm. I would hope for, right? I'm always amazed by by the innovations, right, and the innovative sort of thinking, uh, especially people who are entrepreneurial and take ideas and they run with them, right? Um, so I'm constantly thrilled by emerging technologies um, and how they give new opportunities for designing systems, right? Um, I'll, I will tell a story and maybe I will actually give a plug for one, at least one company. Uh, so I had the privilege of working at the National Science Foundation for two years, uh, about uh, 15 years ago almost. And I, I was the program manager for the thermal transport um, uh, program, which is the heat transfer program at the National Science Foundation. Right? And so, of course, I was everybody's friend because everybody wanted to get grant funding <laughs> right, to, to do their research, especially for university professors. But I did remember I did give um, one award to a professor who was studying a very weird loop heat pipe, mm-hmm. right? This this very strange loop heat pipe that oscillated, right? It had this yeah. weird property in, in that it was naturally unstable because of its uh, because of its surface tension properties and whatever. Um, at the time, it wasn't, didn't even have a name, but but what we're talking about, which is what it's called now, it's called an oscillating heat pipe, right? And so these many years later, that particular application became a product. And now it is a very successful kind of an idea that's being being used for thermal transport in the way that, say, heat pipes are being used. And heat pipes were discovered, you know, back in the 60s for satellite applications, defense applications, and of course now they're, they're you know, they're everywhere mm-hmm. um, in laptops and in so many different applications. So I guess what surprised me, what has continually pleased me is the continual emergence of really innovative technologies, right? And I'm so proud to be an engineer because I keep on seeing these things that are really surprising to me and I said, oh God, how did they do that? <laughs> I'll give you another example. It's not thermal, but Something that's that just again eye opening to me is how do they make these flexible phones, right? <laughs> yeah, these, exactly. Yeah. These, these foldable phones where the the screen is made of a material that is resilient enough, that is high quality enough, that has been engineered well enough to where it can be folded and it won't break and it won't crack. I mean, maybe the layperson might take that for granted, but I, as an engineer, view that as a marvel that. T- took so much ingenuity, material science, uh, mechanical engineering, uh, you know, all different types of inputs to make that into a real product, right? So th- those are some things that thrill me, right? And mm-hmm. I view the same kind of things in in thermal engineering. I continue to see that. Um, and I will tell you that we need emerging technologies. One of the things that's happening in electronics is again we're being driven to really high heat fluxes 
chip level heat fluxes, not only hot spots on the chip, but overall average heat fluxes on the chip. They're getting to be so high that now it's demanding every possible approach, including, say, heat spreading, right? So in the past, heat spreading was, um, was less important. Now it's very important because now mm-hmm. we need to be able to get heat to the areas where we can remove the heat mm-hmm. with a liquid, right? And those are called heat spreaders. And that's what oscillating heat pipes might be able to do, right? In addition sure. to vapor chambers, right? Things like that. Uh, I'll mention one other thing that to me is really neat that I that I view as having limitless opportunities, and that's uh, additive manufacturing, right? 3D yeah, printing, yeah, yeah. right? I, I view 3D printing as having a potential to to be fundamental to future thermal design, right? To the design mm-hmm. of thermal fluid systems, right? I, I have used uh, 3D printing already to to uh, print innovative coal plates or innovative heat sinks, right? And and we're just getting started. There's a lot of people working mm-hmm. in this direction. So in our field, I think it might have the potential to to open up many uh, many design spaces that were previously not available to us, right? I tell people um, the way I view it is in the past we settle for what we're able to fabricate right yeah, yeah. um and that's what we that's what we use then but but if you ha- have 3d capabilities 3d additive capabilities then you're no longer constrained to what you can fabricate now what you should ask yourself is what should i fabricate mm-hmm. right what should i fabricate what, what what should be the design that i should use for a heat exchanger or for a co-plate or for some other uh, system that's used for removing heat. It could be a vapor chamber. It could be a, an oscillating heat pipe. Uh, I think that's the other one, and that maybe that's the one that where I see again this intersection of material science, manufacturing, engineering, and and then the fundamental discipline of thermal management, right, or heat transfer, right. Yeah. I'm thrilled by these things. If I sound like a cheerleader for engineering, <laughs> it's because I really love being an yeah. engineer. No, especially like your your last uh, the last point you touch. I mean, that's exactly what we believe in with diabetics as well. Is it's very uh, very try to push for uh, the the state of the art forward as well uh, with uh, combining right. combining advanced manufacturing techniques with advanced design methods to really take a next step. with uh, basically the same physics, huh? just using them in a in a smarter and uh, yeah. smarter and better way. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. One of the areas that we're we're hoping to use 3D printing on is in advanced evaporators, yeah. obviously. Evaporators that have higher performance. Um, it's pretty easy to see that connection, right? Yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So, and, yeah. and yeah. El, where do you see yourself in, in five or ten years? Because, I mean, many things on the roadmap. Right? That's, that's, that's very clear, many many ideas. But in ten years from now, where will, you, will, you, where will we find you? Yeah. Well, really good questions. Such a good thing to think about. I mean, I'm one of these very fortunate people that landed in a job that I love and I've always loved. Um, that's given me every possible, you know, thing that people want from their job. The uh, sort of satisfaction in that it's interesting work, <laughs> satisfaction that you're having an impact, satisfaction that you're impacting people. Maybe that's the most important thing. Mm-hmm. So I think... I, the academic world, however, there's a lot of people who wouldn't like it because of pressures to publish, uh, you know, pressures to bring in research funding, etc. It is it is worrisome. It is stressful. But the other part of it, these other things, uh, getting to teach young minds, getting to work on research, etc. Uh, I don't know of any other job that gives you that flexibility and, and mm-hmm. that uh, freedom to be able to pursue things like that. Um, in, in, in a sense, you, you create your own opportunities. So I don't think I'll be retiring anytime soon. I just I just love the challenges. And also, I love to learn about those challenges. You know, what's mm-hmm. what's killing you, right? You know, what same for you probably in your company, right? I'm sure you are approached by, by uh, customers who have a real need for a solution. And uh, to me, it's really interesting to learn about the need as much as, as it is to talk with them about the solution right wow i mean i can't believe you're faced with this problem right Mm -hmm. so i i I don't think that in 10 years 
maybe I'll be as enthusiastically on a podcast like yours with you, but I think <laughs> I think I'll be I'll be continuing to to run my lab and teach my courses for the foreseeable future, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then at some point, you just simply have to say so long. It's it's mm -hmm. yours to continue, Levin. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so and 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 El, what 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 motivated you then uh, then you to participate in this podcast? Huh? So I mean, because might uh, might have been if we, if we rewind uh, rewind uh, ten years uh, uh, from now. Huh? So ten years ago, we would have done this the podcast. Maybe you would, you would have said the same thing. Huh? Maybe uh, ten years. Maybe I don't <laughs> I don't know if uh, I would be participating in the podcast. So so why uh, what motivated you? Yeah. Well. Uh... Here's what motivated me. I, I feel like at this stage of my career, I'm pretty senior. You know, literally, I've been, I, I got my PhD in 1980. Uh, I started my academic work in 1988, right? Yeah. So I'm probably one of the most senior people working in the thermal management area by now. Again, I tell you, it's a total surprise to me. I don't know how this happened, right? Yeah, was, but somehow it happened. I was going to right. say, yeah, I, I was born in uh, '87, so. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's ridiculous. Nobody should be that young. <laughs> well, anyway, but well, and, to, 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 and even worse, I'm, I'm the oldest of the company at here at Diabetics, so. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh! I know, I know, I know. My students, you know, my students now, all of my students, the, the young students, they're all born. In this century, that's yeah. when I, I said, oh, my God, oh my I'm God. old. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, um, I, I guess I've been working in the field for a really long time. Um, and I guess I'm one of these technology watchers. I, mm -hmm. I paid attention to technology. I have so many friends in the industry that keep me informed. And I love to chat with them about technology. And, of course, I, I watch technology. I've always thought, and, you know... Um, I've always admired people, especially in academia, who also are very closely partnering with industry colleagues mm -hmm. because uh, I call these people gatekeepers, right? Mm -hmm. Gatekeepers are people who somehow have a foot in both camps and are able to be the translator, are able to be the the networker, the the person who can straddle both sides because I don't think I don't think every, that's everybody's cup of tea. You know, I thought the best gatekeeper that we had was god bless him is avi bar cohen right who who passed away a couple of years ago um i, I avi was a little older than me but but not that much older and i always admired avi so much because avi did some beautiful research as a professor but he also wore a very very prominent sort of industry hat <clears throat> and he was able to to kind of navigate these two worlds and get people together bring people together in so many different ways I'm a kind of a poor copy of that, but I do view that as a role, right? And part of the reason for being on this bot podcast is just to share ideas. I mean, you know, just this is what I do and this is why I do it. And I know that I don't work in a vacuum because I talk to so many of you, perhaps some of you that are listening to this podcast. So I'm not working in a vacuum and I try to listen really hard. Um, and then I try to maybe reflect what I'm listening to. I'm not mm -hmm. you. I'm not going to develop a product, but I'm going to help you develop a product i think uh, but i've always thought that especially for young listeners maybe um young listeners what i would challenge them is listen really hard and if you get one idea from this podcast one one inkling of an idea that you hadn't thought about then i was successful so that's yeah. that's why i wanted to be on this podcast i've always i've always said that if you can make one new friend and get one new idea then it was a, worth attending that podcast mm -hmm. or worth attending that yeah that that conference right yeah. so i hope that was successful okay yeah, we'll, time will tell it <laughs> um, <laughs> okay um well, unfortunately we're coming to the end of the of this of this uh, episode but i have uh, a few short questions for your left uh, in in what we call uh, or what i like to call the shockwave round because i'm that kind of nerd yeah uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, what a nerd yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> just to, so just try to answer them as as short as possible um okay but i'm i'm very curious, curious to to hear your answers so maybe first uh, what what's the best piece of advice that you were ever, that you ever received well uh, be who you are and be only who you are. You can't be somebody else. 
Very, very good advice. Absolutely. Um, and then what's your, uh, do you have a favorite quote, uh, a favorite saying or favorite quote? Um, well, it's really very much like what I just said, but yeah. it's a quote from a, a, a cartoon character. His name is Popeye. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Yes, yes, absolutely. Pop uh. Pop Pop Popeye said, I, I am what I am, and that's all what I am. <laughs> and that's Y-A-M, by the way, not A-M. <laughs> and I've always loved that. I, I used to put that on my email signature. It was a cartoon character, but I always thought, golly, that's pretty philosophical. I really love that, and I've always have loved that. Yeah, I didn't, didn't know that quote from him, but I do know uh, that he likes spinach. So <laughs> that comes for something, <laughs> I think. Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, there, is there any book that you would recommend to read? Um, I'm, um, let me think. Y um, yes, I actually, in my field, I read a book. Um, it's called, um, let's see, it used to be called um, Maxwell's Demon. That was the original name of the book. Mm -hmm. It's a book on the history of thermodynamics. Oh, yeah, okay. um, it is now called Time Passes and Heat Rises or something like that. It's by mm -hmm. a professor at William and Mary College. It, it, to me, it was a beautiful, beautifully written book about science for the layperson. It's a very accessible book, but I love it because it it's a very human treatment of a difficult subject, right? Yeah. It talks about uh, about a subject that includes the people who are involved in this. Uh, that's one of my my favorite books. Um, the book that I'm reading now currently that I might recommend is called Atomic Habits, which right. was recommended to me. And it's a it's it's a book basically about how we form habits and how we can break bad habits and how we can gain new habits. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, Fortunately, Christmas just passed, so I can't ask it uh, <laughs> underneath the Christmas tree. But uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll see what what occasion I can uh, I can get one of those books. Um, um, okay. Anyway, yeah. Is there uh, is there one characteristic that you're that you're very thankful for uh, that you have? So um, that helps you in your job or in your in in, well, or in your life. Uh, mm. um, yeah, those are all all good. I mean. I don't want to sound self-serving, but I think a very, really important characteristic is is a, a quality called empathy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, empathy. Yeah, yeah. Empathy, I believe, is really important. I think uh, empathy and humility, from my perspective, are really important qualities that I always respect in people, right? People who emp – empathy means sort of to live in somebody else's shoes, right? View somebody mm -hmm. else's – perspective think about what you do what you say might affect somebody else other than yourself right mm -hmm. um, and I think the people who are empathetic probably are also have a, a certain amount of humility um, and I also think that those two qualities in essence m make people better listeners mm -hmm. so I think I would view those as being qualities I try to embody uh, I'm not sure I'm always successful but I, I really do try very hard to to embody those principles, especially the listening part. And mm -hmm. perhaps yeah. the best compliment, one of the best compliments I ever received was when I was at NSF, a young person spontaneously said, you are a really good listener. Mm -hmm. And I always thought, wow, that's a really nice yeah. thing to say. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be a good listener because <laughs> I think it's really important. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, all right, two more, uh, two, two more or two left and then, uh, then we're at the very end. Um, so, is there anything you would recommend to young engineers who would start in the field of thermal engineering? Uh, students from your class, I, I guess you give them advice uh, almost every course uh, on, on what to do in their career. Uh, any piece of it that you could share? Yeah, I would uh, share one piece of advice that I always give to uh, young aspiring professionals. Uh, I always say the following. I said, when, when you're in a discussion with somebody, whether they're senior or junior to you, um, there's one thing that you, you should assume. Assume that the person that you're talking to is, is at least as smart as you and mm -hmm. probably smarter, yeah. right? A and B. B, assume that the thought process that the person you're talking to is at least as, as uh, shall we say, calculated or at least as uh, thoughtful as your own. If there's a reason that you're talking to somebody, 
then there's a reason that they're talking to you. Mm -hmm. um, so, so my advice to any young professional is, is make these assumptions and do, do not assume somehow that you're one up on the person that you're mm -hmm. talking to, right? I think the best advice I can say, I'll, I'll always assume that you're on level ground, yeah. right? Because to assume otherwise is to, is to have so much hubris, to have so much sort of to be so, um, arrogant as to believe mm -hmm. that you have the higher ground yeah, yeah. surely to surely will get you in trouble in the long run mm -hmm. yeah very good advice uh, all right um last question who should i invite next for the for my next episode <laughs> <laughs> any, any advice there anyone uh, you would recommend i have well i have so many uh People that I know and respect in the industry. Um, <laughs> I would. I, I thought I, you know. I really I, thought you were going to say so. There's so many people that I th that I know and respect. So I'm not going to recommend those. So. <laughs> oh no! Uh, I'll, I'll recommend somebody. I read somebody that I that I don't see very often anymore, but I greatly mm -hmm. respect. That's Dr. Kave Azar. Right? Dr. Ah, yeah. Kave Azar. From, um, um, uh, from ATS or uh, advanced? ATS, yeah, yes. Yeah, he's yeah, the, he's yeah, the yeah. founder. He's the founder of ATS, right? I I think Kave. Well, there's many reasons why I, I, I respect Kave, but I think one of the reasons that, you, that your your podcast listeners might be interested in in hearing him is because he started out as a researcher at mm -hmm. a research lab at, yeah. at Bell Labs, one of the famous research mm -hmm. labs. Yeah. But but he had this desire to be an entrepreneur, right? And he had the courage to be an entrepreneur. And so he left a job and started a company and is still doing it. And he, he's been doing it for more than 20 years, right? Uh, plus he watches technology. He's a cooling specialist. He gives mm -hmm. wonderful short courses, uh, for cooling specialists. I really like, uh, that story. I never probably would have had the courage to do what he did. And I just think, um, you know, listeners might be interested in knowing. His perspective about not only thermal management but entrepreneurship and the role of small companies mm -hmm. in uh, in the evolution of technology. I think he would have a great story to tell. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I'll uh, reach out to him and see if I can get him on the show. Great. Uh, Elder yeah. brings us to the end of this episode. Uh, I really would like to thank you very much for this uh, this talk. It was uh, very very interesting. So I hope to see you in in, uh, in a few few weeks from now at uh, in in real life then uh, at, at Simiterm. Um, so, but uh, thanks again. Take care and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much, and thanks to anybody listening. Um, reach out to me if I can um, answer questions or in some way enlighten you. Uh, that's that's what I love doing. Thanks, Livin. All right, perfect. See you. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you want to hear more, don't forget to subscribe and see you next time.